for uh, the most kind introduction, um, and more particularly the kind invitation here to the ORF in, in Mumbai. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm flattered that you have actually read three of my books. <laughs> this is this is not always the case with um, with uh, my my talks in various parts of the world, uh, but it's really a pleasure to be here. It's my first visit. Uh, to Mumbai in my life. It's my fifth visit to India, but my first visit to Mumbai. And I'm really, really pleased to be here. It's a beautiful city. I um, hadn't appreciated the uh, landscape along the water, but um, you're not here to hear me talk about um, my views of your lovely city, uh, but uh, my thoughts about China's future. And I want to welcome also our colleagues from the Chinese consulate, Huang Niman, Guan Shuguan, Dolai. Um, thank you for coming, and I understand you have another event this evening you may need to go to, so please feel free to leave at any, any moment. I'm, um, that would be fine, but thank you for taking the time to come. Everybody, welcome. Uh, I, we have about, not quite an hour left, so I'm, um, I want to leave as much time for your questions and uh, comments in our uh, discussion about China's future. Uh, as possible. So I'm going to give a rather abbreviated uh, version of introducing my book to you, and I hope I can stimulate you to perhaps go out and order it from Amazon if you haven't already. <laughs> it, it makes a great gift for your loved ones on all, all holidays. Uh, well, the, the topic, um, China's future, is, needless to say, one of the most important uh, in world affairs, uh, China's, I agree with you completely, China's, uh, China has risen. It's no longer rising, uh, it's risen. And what happens inside of China and what happens between China and other countries in the world uh, has profound impact on the stability of the world and on international relations, broadly speaking. So this is a, a key topic. It's also an extraordinarily complicated topic. If you've come this evening for one uh, simplified answer to what is China's future, I have to begin by telling you I'm going to disappoint you. There is no single simplified answer to China's future. That's the reason there's a question mark on the cover of the, of the jacket of the book. Um, it's a really extraordinarily complex uh, country, uh, and trying to predict the future of any country is really uh, extremely difficult. It reminds me of the ancient Indian fable, actually, of the three blind men who feel the elephant, right? And they all think they're feeling a different beast. Well, that's sort of like China watching today. Depends um, which part of the country, you know, you're focusing on, which dimension, I should say. Um, because it's the complexity is uh, what really characterizes China today, and you can make an assertion about China uh, in one one sense, and you can make the counter assertion, and both will have some validity. So, um, this is a really uh, moving target analytically, but I think it's important, it's certainly important in world affairs, and it's important for China specialists to try and um, explain, uh, unwrap, I should say, these uh, complexities. That's the best we can do, uh, is to identify the major variables uh, and the trajectories. Uh, in, in China, or that's the best anybody can do about it in studying any country. Prediction uh, is really impossible, but uh, it is possible to ascertain what the major trend lines are and what the macro variables are and how they um, interact with each other. So that's what this book, rather short book actually, it's a rather small book about a very large topic, um, uh, tries to do. So. Um, I, I would also just begin the, the discussion in, tonight by uh, observing that I think in thinking about China's future, it's very useful uh, to put it, the country into comparative perspective. China is, I like to say, China's distinct, but it is not unique. Okay, Chinese think they're unique, but I'm sorry, China is not unique. China, the more it develops, the more it has in common with other um, newly industrializing economies. Uh, in fact, so there are three comparative perspectives I would suggest that are useful 
uh, for us to uh, use prisms, you might say, prisms through which to look at China. And the first is an economic prism, to understand China as a not a developing country, because it's no longer a developing country. It is now a middle-income country, uh, by the definition of the World Bank, at least. And it's a newly industrializing economy, an NIE. So um, China is not the first NIE or middle-income country in the world. Indeed, um, let me give you three numbers, in fact. 101, 13, and 11. You might wonder, what do these three random numbers have in common? Well, the World Bank tells us that since 1960, 101 countries have uh, have emerged from developing status to middle income status. And they disaggregate that between upper, upper middle income and lower middle income. Um, but basically it's uh, um, 11,000 or so US dollars per capita. So uh, since 1960, just to repeat, 101 countries have made that transition up into the middle income category. Uh, 13. What's 13? Only, of these 101, only 13 have successfully um, navigated through what's called the middle income trap, that stage, and graduated to become fully developed modern economies. Okay, 13 out of 101. So basically, 90% do not get through the middle income trap. They get stuck in the middle income trap and um, continue to develop, but they don't become fully you know, modern economies by World Bank standards. And that includes things other, uh, indices other than per capita income. So uh, that's an important thing to kind of bear in mind. This is a really difficult process. It's difficult to get from being a developing economy to a middle income economy, but it's far more difficult to get from middle income to developed. Right? What's the third number, 11, refer to? Um, so of the 13 successful cases, 11 were one form or another of an authoritarian political system when they went into the middle income trap. Um, but when they merged out, 11 of the 13 were some form or another of a democracy. Two, Israel and Greece, were already democracies when they got into that trap. In other words, there's a 100% correlation, uh, and I would argue it's a causal, it's more than a correlation, it's a causal relationship <laughs> between political liberalization slash democratization and economic modernization. Uh, in other words, at this stage of development, I and mean, this is the core argument of my book, the um, relationship between economics and politics flips. In the first stage of development, from developing to middle income, which China has just spent three decades, uh, more, or a little bit more than three decades, uh, navigating, the political system, you can say, was the independent variable that drove economic development. Authoritarian states are very good um, at development <laughs> at that stage, at allocating resources towards various specific ends. However, uh, in the next stage, the middle income stage, trying to go up, the, those variables flip. And it's politics that is the independent variable that drives economic development. Um, so, or sorry, the, excuse me, the other way around. The economic development drives the uh, change in the political system. The necessities of economic development force change in the political system. So, uh, we have to think about China's future I think in that comparative, that's the first comparative metric. Uh, don't just look at China qua China. That won't get you very far. It helps. It's important. That's what China specialists have to do. Um, but I think uh, that social scientists who work on other um, uh, economies have a lot to teach us. And we need to go out and read that literature and understand the challenges that those countries have faced, the 101, um, because it will help us understand uh, China. Second comparative perspective I would suggest is to see China uh, political system comparatively. What kind of political system is China? It's a Leninist political system. 
that is a subtype of authoritarian political systems. There are various types of authoritarian systems from sultanates and you know, totalitarian dictatorships you know, such as North Korea, sultanates such as Brunei, um, all the way through to military authoritarian regimes such as we have in Thailand today, formerly had in Myanmar, still have a number of African states. Um, and, and there are different types of um, other types of authoritarian systems. Leninist political systems are one subtype, okay, and they have uh, certain characteristics, which I would, which I wrote about in that previous book you mentioned. But um, I would note or include the following elements at least. First of all, what's known as cellular penetration of all institutions in society. That's what Leninist parties do. They burrow their way into all institutions, neighborhoods, schools, every uh, body. They, they penetrate and create literally called cells. Zhu, Dan Zhu in Chinese, um, in, all, in the life of the society, you might say, and the state, and the military. Uh, so they penetrate, uh, they penetrate the military. The militaries in Leninist systems are not loyal to the state, or the government, they're loyal to the party um, and defend the party. That means that they have domestic security responsibilities as well as external security responsibilities. And we have seen the Chinese military several times since 1949 defend the party. You might say rescue the party. <laughs> um, but the party also penetrates this, the government. There are 45 million cadres in China. Uh, these are the people, this is the nomenclatura that run the country. Of those, 39 million are um, in the party system. So this is, you have to think of Leninist parties as um, huge uh, organizations, first of all, that penetrate uh, everywhere. Secondly, and they establish hegemonic party control. They do not permit any challenges to their hegemonic rule. Um, they control personnel of the state. They control personnel of corporations. If you look at the big uh, state-owned enterprises in China, the 160 or so so-called national champions, the CEOs of China, who appoints the CEOs of China? Anybody know? answer is the Organization Department of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> um, so they control the commanding heights of the economy, they control the commanding heights of the state, they control the commanding heights of the army, uh, of educational institutions. If you're a vice chancellor or a president of one of China's leading universities, uh, guess who appoints you? The Organization Department of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Same story. Um, and they control the internal, very large internal security apparatus. They tolerate no dissent. Uh, they have minimal tolerance for civil society and other features. So these are, and they control information, media, and so on. So this is a Leninist system. And so we've seen in history a number of other Leninist political systems in the world. That previous book that Mr. Kolkarni referenced I wrote ab about the CCP in comparative perspective to these other Leninist parties. And what they learned, that book was about what the Chinese Communist Party learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union and the East European party states, uh, pro and con. Um, so we have to understand, therefore, the evolution of those Leninist party states. Let me just advance quickly through to that slide. Okay, all Leninist party states pass through a very predictable evolution of six stages. Uh, if you look at the Soviet Union, East European states, Vietnam, they all follow this pattern, scholars argue. Um, and China has also followed this pattern perfectly. Uh, China is um, in the uh, last stage right now, um, and the reason there's a question mark at the end is because no Leninist party, not a single one, has ever succeeded in 
adapting, this is, goes back to the last book, adaptation. When I wrote about in that book, they were in the midst of adaptation, trying to uh, create limited pluralism in order to cope with atrophy, stagnation, and um, ossification. All Leninist parties atrophy. That's the independent variable. The question is, what do they do about it? Do they rejuvenate themselves, renew themselves, or do they become sclerotic, defensive, insecure, um, corrupt, and eventually, and decline, and eventually die? So uh, China has followed from 1949 to the present these six stages perfectly. And so they're at the last stage, and up until 2009, or between, to be precise, the decade 2000, sorry, 1998 to 2008, which is what that previous book was about, um, they were trying to adapt. And they were doing pretty well. And then in 2009, 2009-10, for a variety of reasons that I don't have the time to go into, but I'd be happy to explain to you, they switched. And they have become very defensive, very insecure, very repressive, more repressive, um, and um, are showing all the signs of a declining Leninist system. If you look at it as a system, a shi tong, a qi shi for our Chinese friends who are here, because the Chinese friends are very dubious about this argument. Um, so that's the second uh, um, comparative perspective we need to bring to bear to understand China today. Third comparative perspective is, is Chinese history, right? Had a long history, been through a lot of dynasties. These dynasties um, renew themselves, they evolve, they change, they decline, they die, they rise again. <laughs> they go through these same cyclical patterns. Um, so Chinese historians of China I think have a lot to offer as well for our understanding of China. And if you read this work of Chinese historians who work on what you might call the declining phases of dynasties, they note the following characteristics. Um, popular unrest, usually rural agrarian unrest, uh, factional scheming within the imperial court, an isolated emperor um, and who becomes increasingly tyrannical, but is isolated, and the more isolated he becomes, the more tyrannical he becomes. Uh, a corrupt, corruption throughout the system, a state ideology and doctrine that is hollow, devoid of meaning for the citizenry and nobody believes in, um, economic dislocations, natural disasters, and pressures on China's borders and territorial integrity from outside and a few other features. So when you think of that list, which characterizes certainly the decline of the Ming and the Qing, but other dynasties, a number of those elements are present today in China, absent natural disasters. And we hope that China doesn't have natural disasters. So um, these are three comparative met prisms that I think we are it would be useful to draw upon. Okay, so um, this book, well, no, but China faces today, China's really at a, a turning point or a series of turning points. Um, the challenges it faces today are unprecedentedly complex and severe, I would argue. And muddling through is not going to work any longer. Uh, the, adapt, the sort of incremental uh, adaptation that China's shown so been so successful at feeling the stones while crossing the river they like to say um, is not going to suffice to deal with the totality of economic challenges social challenges and I would argue political challenges that China faces today um, and the Chinese leadership is actually quite open about um, the uh, these challenges the former um, Premier Wen Jiabao, uh, if just before he stepped down um, four years ago, in 2007, he bluntly described the nation's economy as characterized by what he called the four uns, unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. 
unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. The reason that significant, those terms, those characterizations are significant is this is the premier of the country. This is the man in charge of the Chinese economy, characterizing it that way. Um, the, his successor, the current premier, Li Keqiang, uh, similarly last year uh, offered a fairly dire assessment. And I quote, he said, China's economic growth model remains inefficient, our capacity for innovation is insufficient, overcapacity is a pronounced problem, and the foundation of agriculture is weak. Okay, that's the current premier uh, <laughs> prognosis on the state of his economy. Um, the current leader of the country, Xi Jinping, also lamented last year, quote, the tasks our party faces in reform, development, and stability are more onerous than ever, and the conflicts, dangers, and challenges are more numerous than ever. So here you have China's three, three of China's most senior leaders, all recognizing publicly the severity of the situation. Um, so they're not in denial, I would argue. Um, they may be... Uh, in denial about some of the linkages between the challenges that they face, I would argue they are in denial about the political, the politics of their future. Um, but they're pretty um, transparent and open and even realistic about the economic challenges. And if you read the document of the third plenary session, third plenum of the last uh, central, or of this central committee from 2013, this is a major document of economic reforms. 64 categories, 350 or so specific reforms. This is the blueprint for getting out of the middle income trap, for NAVIC, for going up, this, up, become a developed modern economy and get through this period. It's, it was very well thought out, very well drafted. I have to say, it was really drafted for China by the World Bank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you read the World Bank 2030 report, China 2030, um, that was done by Robert Zellick when he was president of the bank, and Wen Jiabao, when Wen Jiabao was the premier, they agreed to do this China 2030 report. Well, the Chinese basically took a lot of the report and boom, put it into their third plenum document. That was four years ago. Um, and uh, in the intervening four years, uh, we have seen uh, minimal implementation of that document. Uh, about 15 to 20 percent at best is the analysis of many organizations. It was a stillborn document. It's still there, and it still does provide, I think, a very intelligent roadmap ahead, but it hasn't been implemented, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, resistance from vested interest groups, uncertainty in the high-level economic policy making of China, um, uh, an over-reliance on fiscal stimulus measures to pump up the prop up the economy, pump up the economy, um, the anti-corruption campaign, the politic which is a a political campaign, you might say, a very very necessary and important campaign that Xi Jinping has initiated. Um, but it's having, you might call, collateral side effects on the bureaucracy. It has frozen up the Chinese bureaucracy. Everybody is frightened of, and afraid of being arrested and brought down. And that makes people very risk-averse. <laughs> makes people not even go to the office and not go to work. And there are many cases of this. And they're certainly not going to take risky measures under such conditions. So there are a variety of reasons, and the other reason I would say the document has never been implemented is it didn't offer any uh, sort of uh, prioritization or sequencing in it. They just sort of threw out 350 reforms, but there was no indication that, you know, one, two, number one, two, three, four, do this first, that next, and that third. So if you're a cadre in the system having to implement this document, what do you do? You know, uh, you're confused. You look for instructions, and the instructions have not been forthcoming. So there's so there are a number of reasons that the document has 
not yet been implemented. Now it's still there, it's a master plan, and it could well be implemented at any point in time, including after the next party Congress this autumn, coming autumn. So uh, let me just run through uh, briefly some of the challenges I think China faces today. There are a lot of good things going on in China that we must be aware of, um, but we have to be equally sober about uh, the difficulties in China. And these slides I'm about to put up tend to emphasize the difficulties, they tend to emphasize the challenges. Um, but as I say, uh, there are a number of positive developments in each of these categories too. So, in, and the book is organized along these functional lines. There's a chapter on China's economy, China's society, China's political system, uh, China's foreign relations, and then fi finally a chapter on the future with different pathways. So I'm going to put these slides up. I'm going to let you read them for yourselves while I'm talking, because if I go through each of these elements, we will be here all night. So I will just emphasize one or two bullet points from each of the slides, okay? But this is the uh, list, or at least it's my list, of what uh, the major challenges facing the Chinese leadership in the are in the economic domain. Uh, the uh, let me emphasize, as I say, the, the second bullet point: the need to change the macroeconomic growth model. So, the growth model that Deng Xiaoping launched in 1978, that has been so extraordinarily successful, was based on what I call the old two two factors: fixed asset investment low-end uh, manufacturing based on surplus labor, and then those goods are exported abroad. Little value added, primary products, and fixed asset investment into hard infrastructure largely. That's built, literally has built the country uh, to what it is today. But that, and that's been state-directed, and that's where authoritarian states are really good at channeling investment. Um, and this work, but that's not going to get them to through the middle income trap. So they need to adjust the macro growth model to three new drivers: uh, <coughs> personal consumption, services, and innovation. Um, by their own um, admission, and the World Bank's suggestion. So, uh, and we're actually seeing some positive statistics in the last couple of years on the. Uh, growth of the service sector and uh, and the consumption side, um, but not yet anyway on the innovation side. I'll come back to innovation in a second because it's really the key, the key uh, element that will get uh, well of those eleven of those thirteen countries that got through the middle income trap. All thirteen of them innovated their way out of the trap and move up the value added chain. So innovation, absolutely fundamental for China's future, um, uh, which is down near the bottom. Uh, I would also note the debt problem. China, which is a huge uh, thundercloud or lag laggard factor hanging over the uh, country's economy. It is now nearing 300% of GDP, 282 is the figure I've last seen. Um, there's debate amongst economists. It's somewhere between 250 and 280 or 90 percent of GDP of a um, 10 trillion dollar economy. That means there's 25 uh, trillion, 25 to 30 trillion dollars of debt, and this debt is not coming back. <laughs> Why? Because 70 percent of it is corporate debt, um, and the remainder really is local government debt. And that's both of which have been uh, subsidies, in effect, from the central government to the state-owned enterprises um, to pet projects at the local level through local governments. So there's no collateral. This is, these aren't loans like we know normally because China doesn't really have a banking system the way we think of banking systems, <laughs> you know, where you do feasibility studies and you check the credit of the person you're loaning money to and their ability to repay the loan, 
and find some collateral against the loan. China doesn't operate like that. <laughs> it's a you know spigot for turning on central stimulus funds to whatever wherever they want to turn whenever and wherever they want to turn it on to. So this is huge. Um, economists are really worried about it. This is red light flashing territory, and the st the hedge funds and international um, uh, investment firms, Goldman Sachs and others, really frightened. I go to these meetings to speak to them from time to time, and it's really at the top of their uh, list of worries. You've got inflated stock markets, you've got another property bubble in not just Tier 1, but Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities today. I just took a train from Shanghai to Beijing a couple months ago, which is a great experience I'd never, never done before. Five hours, it's fantastic. Um, but you go through Shandong and um, a couple of other provinces, but particularly Shandong, you just pass ghost city after ghost city after ghost city of high-rise buildings with no human life. Nobody lives there. But they've been built because, as I say, the spigot was turned on, the, fix, the money flowed, went to the com construction company, they built the building. And they rake off percentages of, of corrupt, uh, this is called rent seeking, you know, corrupt uh, cash uh, from the projects. So that's overcapacity, right? Well, they have overcapacity in the steel industry and other primary um, uh, industrial industries as well. So those are just, uh, the currency has really been weakening and they've been spending, they've spent a trillion, sorry, they've spent, uh, yeah, basically a, almost a trillion dollars in the last year. They've burned through a trillion dollars trying to prop up the currency. Somebody needs to tell this to Donald Trump, who seems to think that the Chinese currency is inflated. It's not inflated, it's deflated. <laughs> um, Inflated stock markets. You saw what happened last summer, two summers ago, with the Shanghai markets. That again, these are not these stock markets don't function like normal stock markets. <coughs> Need for financial sector restructuring, capital outflow. Oh gosh, here is a very telling fact about China today, about the elite. I'm not sure if this is an economic factor or if it's a political factor, but the economic elite of the country are moving their personal assets abroad in ever-increasing uh, numbers. $982 billion in 2015, according to Standard Chartered Bank, which is the most widely circulated accepted figure in this, almost a trillion dollars. This is not investment. This is not foreign direct investment. These are, this is people's pocketbooks. This is, their, this is the middle class and the upper middle class of China moving their money out of China. Um, buying property abroad, um, moving their family members abroad, uh, you know, and really have one foot out the door of their own country. This tells me volumes about the potential instability of China. Anytime a country's elite have one foot out the door and are hedging and are moving their, their own assets out, that tells you that they don't have a whole lot of confidence in their own uh, system's future. That's very telling to me. Um, now, the government has been trying to crack down on this. You're only allowed to take $50,000 out of the country what is it, once a month. They've been trying to place capital controls on this and so on. But Chinese are pretty clever, and they're moving huge amounts of money, private money, out of the country all the time. OK, so those are some of the economic challenges, lest you think that I think it's all bad news. Here's some good news. Growth rate's still high, 6 to 7%. But I would note that high growth rates tell me that they are not tackling the structural features of the third plenum package. What you really want to see is growth rates come down to 2 to 3%, because uh, that means they're biting the bullet on a lot of the fiscal or financial sector reforms, state-owned enterprise reforms, and others. So as long as it's up, they're pumping money into this. That's fiscal stimulus. And that blows up the debt bubble. I mean, it's just an endless cycle. But the growth rates are high. OK, so not as high as India. India now is higher. Uh, they've eliminated a lot of red tape, a lot of regulatory streamlining in recent years. 
a lot of credit due to Lee Ka-Chung, the premier for that. They are um, very aware of the innovation challenge. They're trying to create innovation hubs in Shenzhen, Chongqing, and already in Zhuguanzun in uh, Beijing. Um, they've launched this One Belt, One Road initiative, which we can talk about. It's very ambitious. They've established free trade zones, but they haven't really They've been established, but they haven't been developed, per se. And they've launched the uh, Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership Program, RCEP, which is actually a Southeast Asian ASEAN initiative that the Chinese have sort of taken over. So they're, they're good. And, oh, the one thing I should put up here, which I didn't, is the private sector. The private sector is now the driver of the economy. 65%, uh, I believe, of GDP growth last year was accounted for from the private sector. So there are good things going on in the Chinese economy, but less, I think we need to pay attention to those structural issues. Um, society, there's a list of uh, social challenges. This is, a, I think, a um, not as stable a society as it seems on the surface. Uh, there's a lot of frustration in society. Incomes are relatively stagnating. Um, the stratification is widening. China has uh, one of the top ten Gini coefficient uh, in the world of uh, 0.47, I think. That's the official Chinese figure. Um, measures social inequality, income inequality. Uh, but, and they have a very volatile, what I call the volatile periphery. Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. it's all the way around there western and southern flanks. These are parts of China that are difficult for the central government to control. Uh, Xinjiang and Tibet are controlled um, through very heavy use of internal security forces uh, and occupation, you have to say. Hong Kong, Taiwan each have their own distinct elements. We can talk about either of those if you want, but um, that's, for, from Beijing's perspective, these four places are big headaches. Then you can read for yourself the rest of them, but I'll just highlight one of that, repression. Uh, we have seen, China's always been repressive to some extent, um, but it's rarely been as repressive as it is now. This is the most repressive period since the aftermath of Tiananmen in 1989 against civil society, against NGOs, against dissent of all forms, against intellectuals, against universities, even against students, um, Weibo users, social media, the internet. It's, this is pretty draconian in China right now. It's not as bad as after Tiananmen. I lived in China in 1990 90 and 91. That was really bad. The country was under martial law. It's not, under, it's not as bad now as it was then, but it's, I would say, the worst it's been now since then. And that, I would argue, is another very telling factor about the regime. This is not, in my view, a confident regime. This is not a secure regime. This is a highly insecure, unconfident regime. Repression is an uh, indicator of insecurity, right? If you're secure, you loosen up. You give uh, elements of society space. You're tolerant, you know? Um, and authoritarian systems can do that. China was doing that up until 2009. But since 2009, we have seen, and again, it's, that's an important date, 2009. Xi Jinping was not the ruler of China in 2009. He didn't become the ruler until 2012. So this repression predates him, but it has intensified uh, more under his watch. So there's a lot of volatility um, in Chinese society. Political um, challenges, again, you can read them for yourself. I would start with an over-concentration of power in Xi Jinping. Uh, this man is the strongest Chinese leader China's had since Deng Xiaoping. Um, he's very confident, he's very capable, he's very impressive, uh, his speech in Davos included. Um, so 
you know, on one hand, this, this man uh, knows where he wants to take China, and he's taking actions. Um, he's decisive. He's, he's got a vision. It's laid out in the 454-page book, uh, The Governance of China, by Xi Jinping. If you haven't read it, you should dig through the 454 pages. There are actually some interesting insights in there. Um, but he's sitting on top, he's, he's amassed power in himself. So for thirty last 30 years, the Chinese Communist Party has been trying uh, to uh, do what Deng Xiaoping told them to do, create a collective, consensual political system at the top, which includes regular retirements, meritocratic training in the party school system, um, and f flirtation with local elections, um, and um, even open media and open, relatively open civil society. So the Chinese were doing those things, but have stopped and have now stifled the educational system, the media, the internet, the social media, civil society, public sphere, intelligentsia. It's just been one big crackdown since 2009. Um, so the political situation is really uh, quite unstable, I think. And so if you look at the system versus the leader, but there's a lot of resentment about Xi Jinping having amassed all this power himself. I've talked to people, party members in the system, who are not at all happy with it. And um, his corruption campaign, anti-corruption campaign, as necessary as it is, has, as I said earlier, produced a kind of culture of fear, um, particularly for people in the party, but in the military, too. There have been 82 generals and 4,000 officers of the People's Liberation Army who have been, put, who have been brought down in the anti-corruption campaign. Think about that for a second. And that, that figure is nearly two years old. So now, one would assume it's over 100 generals and probably over 5,000 officers. That is a huge purge. State council, government, similar. Big corporations, similar. So as necessary as it is, and it's very popular with the public, the public loves the anti-corruption campaign. They love Xi Jinping for the anti-corruption campaign. I'm just saying the, anti the elite don't love Xi Jinping for the anti-corruption campaign. Uh, and they are leaving the country, and they are not happy with it. So these are some of the political challenges. Um, foreign relations is the last category. And uh, I see that as mixed overall. Um, improving at the moment, you know, it, like all countries, China's external relations kind of oscillate. They get worse and they get a little better. At the moment, I would characterize them as better, certainly in Asia um, and in Europe and in the Middle East. Um, they're deteriorating in Africa, actually. And I would say they're kind of holding steady in Latin America. They are very bad with the United States. U.S.-China relations are not in a good state. Um, and um, this is all, I think, to be expected. If you're a major power, you're a global power, not everybody is going to love you. Uh, this comes as sort of a surprise to the Chinese. You know, we, we think very well of, we're very benign, we want win-win cooperation, you know, we want to have all these strategic partnerships, work together with others, yet if you look at public opinion polls around the world, they're mixed. They're not negative, but they're not positive. They're just mixed. So China doesn't have the, uh, China, the global image of China doesn't match China's own self-image. There's a gap there. And that brings up the whole soft power question, at which they're investing a lot of money into, about $10 billion a year, these posters around the room, I would imagine, were donated by the Chinese consulate here in Mumbai. Uh, that is part of the global soft power campaign, literally. That's my guess, but that's how I imagine they got on your walls. Um, well, that's what the cultural affairs section of, of consulates abroad are supposed to do, push China's image. What kind of image? Well, just look at the posters. And, 
That's the kind of image China wants to create in the world. Um, so they're out there doing that stuff. Confucius Institutes, Radio China Radio International, nine different languages for China's central television. The China Daily now publishes in eight foreign languages. And a lot of a huge effort in the cultural domain. In Chinese, they call this Dui Wai Shen Chuan, external propaganda work. Dui Wai Shen Chuan. Um, so it's not really public diplomacy. It's external propaganda work. And we need to understand it for what it is. Um, have they gotten a return on their investment for the $10 billion a year they pour into all these things? Um, well, if you judge it by global public opinion polls, the answer is no. Public opinion surveys of around the world, including in places like Africa, which used to have very high ratings, they've come down. China's global image mixed, as I say. Um, hard power, on the other hand, growing. That means China's military power. Navy in particular, but also ballistic missiles, cyber, virtually all, all elements of the Chinese military establishment. The Chinese Navy and submarines are now sailing uh, through the Indian Ocean with increased regularity. Um, there may be a Chinese submarine off of Mumbai out here. Who knows? Not sure, but there isn't today. There will be shortly. <laughs> They're already out there? Okay. Um, so, and then we have uh, Mr. Trump, who, well, let me say before I get to Mr. Trump, I would like to give Xi Jinping personally credit and China credit for improving their contributions to global governance. The speech at Davos is an example of that. China has really upped its game in the last four years in this broad category we call global governance. That ranges from fighting uh, public health pandemics to anti-piracy operations to UN peacekeeping operations to global economic governance through the G20 and other multilateral bodies um, to the, their own contributions to the UN operating budget. Here's the world's second leading economy in the world, and they are now the second leading financial contributor to the United Nations as of last year. Previously, they've been number nine or something. So they're starting to, they've really up, and this is, comes after a long period of time in which the West has been calling on China to contribute more to global governance. That's why I called them a partial power. They were a free rider in this area. Um, they're no longer a free rider. I think they, they're still not completely there. They could be doing a whole lot more in counterterrorism than they are. They could be providing a lot more aid, ODA, to poor developing countries. You know what the Chinese aid budget is, anybody? What would you guess? I can tell you, $3.5 billion. Um, this is, again, a $10 trillion economy, world's second largest economy, $3.5 billion. You know what the American aid budget is? And we're struggling economically. But we still get $38 billion each year in aid, 10 times more than, United, than China. I'm not trying to sing America's praises. There are many people, including Trump, who thinks that's misspent money. And so you might see the American aid budget come down. But we should certainly see the Chinese aid budget go up. Um, China, I would though say they do a lot of good work in the aid that they do give in Africa in particular, in public health in particular, in agriculture, in tertiary education. It's not all infrastructure. They're, not, they're building a lot of sports stadiums, palaces, presidential palaces, convention centers and that stuff, not to mention rail lines and ports. Um, but they're doing a lot of good soft, you might say soft uh, aid and infrastructure. Okay, so. Let me just conclude with um, the pathways to the future. So this is one, at least it's my kind of conceptualization of the options for China in the future. It's like driving into a roundabout um, and you can take different turnings off of the roundabout. I suppose you could keep going around the roundabout too, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna help. Um, but it's important to uh, understand for a car or a nation, actually more important for a nation than for a car, uh, what, ro what road you come into the roundabout on. Because 
the predominant tendency of countries, uh, political scientists argue, is what they call path dependency. Just keep doing what you're doing. It's easy, there's financial reasons, allocations, uh, to just sort of carry on. So the road that China has been on, I would argue, since 2009, is hard authoritarianism. Um, and I've already discussed the elements of that in the previous slides. Prior to 2009, I want to emphasize again, they were on the path of soft authoritarianism. But they, and it, they did make a change. This was a very unusual thing. As I say, most countries keep doing what they're doing. They made a conscious change. And there were several reasons in 2009 that that happened, uh, why that happened. You know, personnel reasons, um, riots, uh, bureaucratic reasons, and um, the retirement of an individual. So I, mean, I can go give you the specifics if you're interested, but uh, that was the one time when China really did make an, a sharp change. So they could go back to soft authoritarianism. I hope they do. It's much better in their interest to do so in terms of economic development. It may not be the, the best solution in terms of sustaining party rule. And in China, sustaining party rule trumps economic development. It trumps everything. Keeping the party in power is what it's all about. And there's a, now a great friction between these reforms economically in the third plenum package and keeping the party in power. There's just some very fundamental contradictions and Xi Jinping has made his choice. Um, it's very evident. He's not implementing his own package, propping up the state-owned industries and so on and so forth. So those are the two main options. They, then there are two minor options. The repression could get worse and they could lurch backwards into uh, a, what I call neo-totalitarianism, which was what China was after the Tiananmen events of 1989. They're not there yet, but as I say, they, they could, could get worse. I could envision that happening if the reforms really do falter, if there's large-scale unrest and a series of very conservative leaders come to the fore at the top of the system. China has no shortage of conservative leaders, <laughs> believe me. Um, what they have a shortage of are liberal leaders. So it could go that way conceptually, although I don't think it will. And uh, it could become even more open, but this semi-democracy, if I had to redraw this slide, I would have it evolving out of soft authoritarianism. It's not an alternative. If you look at these 11 countries I mentioned, the successful cases that were authoritarian going into the trap and became democratic coming out of the trap, they all evolved through a soft authoritarian phase before they became democracies. Um, so that would, I imagine, would be what would happen in China. Okay, so those are the four options. Let me just finish by giving you the four consequences of these uh, choices. So if they stay on the current path, um, we can expect uh, limited economic reform, uh, relative economic stagnation, and the word there of importance is relative. A $10 trillion economy growing at 7%, you can't really call that stagnation. <laughs> it's not Japanese-style stagnation, to be sure. Um, so, um, but it's not making the structural adjustments uh, to move up the value-added chain. And uh, protracted political decline. Now, I want to be very clear here. I am not predicting or advocating the collapse of China or the Chinese Communist Party. People seem to think I'm a collapse theorist now. I'm not a collapse theorist. I don't want that for China. That's not my analysis. That happened to be a headline of an article I wrote that was, uh, that was used by the newspaper. It wasn't my headline. It was chosen by the editors of the newspaper and it uh, misrepresented my views. So I want to disassociate myself. I hope everybody, especially our Chinese friends in the audience, um, hear very clearly that I'm not a collapse theorist and I don't want that for China. Um, but I do see the political system as in a state of protracted decline for the reasons I expressed earlier, uh, namely the Leninist life cycle. So if they go back to soft authoritarianism, that's not a complete panacea. That's not going to solve all their problems, but it'll help a lot on the economic side, and particularly on the social side, because scholars have found of the, thir of the yeah, 13 
countries, you need to have an open, inclusive, tolerant uh, relationship with your own society, civil society in particular. Um, so that would be the best option uh, for China. Um, and if it evolved from there into semi-democracy, then they will become a fully developed economy. Um, so what's my prediction? But that's basically the choice they have between hard and soft authoritarianism. They can stay on the path they're on now, um, and it's not particularly good, they're not a particularly good outcome. Maybe the easiest path, and it will keep the party in it probably has the greatest ability to keep the party in power, um, although I would argue that it, it accelerates the decline, the structural systemic decline of the party state. Um, that's number two. Or they can go back to political reform, as I say, and have better chances. So the ultimate question is here, does the regime have the confidence to open up again politically, as they were doing? I have to remind you, this is not a new option that, they, that I'm suggesting they do. I'm suggesting they go back to what they were doing. Um, that would help them succeed economically and socially. So let me stop there at 7.30 which is, I know, the hour we're supposed to conclude, but I'd be happy to stay and take questions uh, for 15 minutes or something. Yeah? Okay, great. Thanks for your attention.